last week we started this series, Me First. Let me just go ahead and say this to you right off the bat. I've been super, super encouraged by all of your Me First um, posts that you're making on Facebook. I, it, that's just been phenomenal for me to read. I've tried to like every one of them that I've seen on Facebook. If I didn't like yours, it's because I didn't see it. But uh, I just want to say thank you because l that tells me that you listened and that you obeyed and you were encouraged by the word and now you're encouraging other people uh, by the me first hashtags and so I want to say thank you for that so for those of you who don't know we did start this series last week and and I want to go ahead and just explain to you what I mean whenever I say me first we talked about this last week uh, but for those of you that may not have been here I just need to give you a definition of what I mean when I say me first I'm not talking about selfishness I'm talking about a person with a me first mentality is a man or a woman who is willing to step out first and do what others may not be willing to do in order to advance the kingdom of God and set an example for other people. That's what I mean when I say a person that has a me first mentality. Now, last week we talked about a person who had a me first mentality has this characteristic about them. They are humble enough to serve. They are humble enough to serve. And of course, we looked at the greatest example that any of us will ever have in our entire lifetime and the lifetimes after ours and the lifetimes before ours. The greatest example of a servant is Jesus, right? We know that Jesus was humble enough to serve us in this particular manner. He left the glories of heaven to come down here and clothe himself in flesh, right? To die on the cross for sins he did not commit. And when he was down here, he did not use his deity to his advantage. In other words, the only time that he ever used his deity was so that he could benefit the kingdom of God, benefit the Father, and benefit us. And so he carried himself straight to the cross of Calvary, and he died on the cross, and he did all of that so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. That is the greatest example you will ever see of someone being humble enough to serve. Now, this week, that was last week. This week, I want us to take a look at the second characteristic of a person who has a me-first mindset. So here it is. Those with a me-first mindset are willing enough to go. They're willing enough to go. They're humble enough to serve, but they're willing enough to go. Listen to this statement. As great as it is to be humble enough to serve, it doesn't do the world any good if we're not willing enough to go. You can sit around all day long and talk about how you're humble enough to serve other people. But if you don't go serve other people, it's not doing anybody any good. Does that make sense in the house today? So we have to not only be humble enough to serve, but we've got to be willing enough to go and do whatever it is that God has called us to do. Now imagine this. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, you've got a, a Bible in front of you. You've got pages in that Bible. And if you will search out the pages in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find that there is action all over the pages of the Bible. You're going to find that there are people going all over the pages of the Bible. Imagine if you opened up the Bible what it would look like if there was no action. Imagine what the Bible would be like if there was no one in the Bible that was actually going and doing what God instructed them to do. It'd be rather boring, amen? I would say this to you, it would be rather blank. It would be a leather cover opened up, blank pages, and nothing interesting whatsoever. Imagine this, if the Bible had no action, what if Moses didn't go to the Israelites and rescue them from slavery? What if uh, Abraham didn't go where God wanted him to go and leave his family, go to an unknown, unknown land where he would receive the promise of God that benefits us today because of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ? What if David refused to go fight Goliath and redeem the dignity of the people of God? What if Paul chose not to go and preach to the Gentiles so that they would be without the gospel, which means that you and I would not have the gospel today if he had not gone to the Gentiles? And then the greatest one of all, what if Jesus did not go to the cross to die for our sins? See, the pages of the Bible are filled with action. They are filled with people who went, people who took seriously going and doing what God had called them to do. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that the Bible is filled with that. But here's what I also know. The church is supposed to be filled with that too. 
The church is supposed to be filled with people that are going and doing what God has called them to do. You say, preacher, why can't we just, man, listen, this is too hard. Why can't we just receive the gospel, accept the gospel, and just chill out? Why can't we just, you know, get saved and we're saved and who cares about everybody else because that's their own responsibility. Why can't we just receive the gospel and just chill out, don't worry about anybody else, just come to the church, rest on the pews and not worry about anybody else. Here's why we can't do that. Because that's not what Jesus said to do, number one. And number two, that's not the example that Jesus set for us. Jesus set for us a different example and we see it in Mark chapter 1 verse 35 through 39. Now keep this in mind as way of context of this passage of Scripture. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Jesus is already doing miraculous stuff where He is. Okay? So the Bible says in verse number 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus got up with the chickens. Amen? He got up early. And before daylight, He went out and He departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. Jesus was trying to get away from folks. Have anybody, anybody in here ever tried to do that? How many of y'all find it real hard to get away from people? Right? You know what I'm saying? If you got as many kids as I got, it's hard to get away from people. You know? And, and so sometimes we just need to get alone to that solitary place so that we can pray and talk to God. And no doubt, that's what Jesus was doing. And then all of a sudden it says, And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. See there? Jesus couldn't even hardly get by himself. And Joker's come looking for him. And what does Simon say when he gets there? Simon says, hey, everybody's looking for you. And I, don't you know Jesus at times was going, stinking humans, always looking for me. But the reality is Jesus was very popular. I mean, you don't, you don't heal people in the manner that Jesus healed people and not be pretty popular with some folks. You know what I'm saying? So people are always looking for Jesus. And here we find Jesus. He's done miraculous things. He's out there praying to the Father. Now listen, this is my assumption. This is what I'm saying I believe about this text. You don't have to believe this. But I believe that Jesus was there praying about what else God wanted him to do next. And so they came to him and they said, Hey, everybody's looking for you. But he said this to them. Let us go. Go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. You see that? Jesus said, I mean, he's already doing great stuff where he's at. And, Je and yet Jesus said, but let us go to the next town. Let us go somewhere else. You know, you and I, we have problems with wanting to stay. And Jesus is saying, no, we got to go. See, sometimes we get comfortable, right? We get very, very comfortable in our own bubble. We get very comfortable in our four walls. And yet what we see is an example of Jesus that is saying, hey, no, you've got to go get folks. Hey, look, church, you got to hear me. We can't be comfortable with just the people we got we got to go get some more. we got to go reach some others. we got to go to some other towns. Because that's the example that Jesus Christ has set for us. Jesus understood the importance of Him going and preaching the gospel to other people. So Jesus says, no, we've got to go. So where do we get this idea, this example of going? Y'all with me? Say amen. We get it from Jesus. That's what Jesus said we ought to do. So... Here's what I'm going to do. I, I, you know, every, every sermon I preach, I try, to, I try to have decent transitions, you know what I mean, from one thing to the next. And I got right here at this point, and I said, I don't have a good transition. I just, I've got Jesus understood how important it is to go with the gospel. He understood his purpose and his mission, and he's given us this task as well. Blank. I'm like, I don't have a good transition. So here's how I'm going to transition. You look at your neighbor and say, he's about to transition. So let me give you three attributes of those who are willing to go. Are oh, you got it? Three attributes of those who are willing to go. Me first people, they're humble enough to serve and they're willing enough to go. Now let me give you three attributes of those willing enough to go. Number one, they go with the gospel on their mind. Those people who are willing to go, they go with the gospel on their mind. When Jesus got ready to leave this earth, he said to his disciples that he was going to prepare a place in heaven for them. Can you, does that excite anybody other than me? I cannot wait to see what the place looks like that Jesus has got prepared for me. Amen. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I just got to feel. I don't even want to tell you what I think it's going to look like, but it's going to be awesome. I believe it's going to be awesome. So he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. 
that where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise that God has given us. He's preparing the place. He's coming back. He's going to get us, bring us to where he is. But in the meantime, he gave us something that we ought to be doing. It's called the Great Commission. We talk about it all the time. You say, preacher, are we on the Great Commission again? You better believe it. Every Sunday we ought to be about the Great Commission. So what is the Great Commission for those? Because you remember, I read an article one time that said people don't even know the Great Commission. Let me just say this to you. If you're in this church and six years from now, somebody asks you what the Great Commission is, and you say, my church never taught me that, you a liar and the truth ain't in you. Amen? Come, I, that's a good place for y'all to say amen. Encourage the preacher. You heard it. Here's what it says. Great Commission. Go, wait a minute, can we, can we, look, can we change, can we get an erasable Bible and change that to stay, therefore? No, he said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all, listen to that, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I'm about to make a statement, and I want you to hear this, because Jesus said to them that they ought to go and make disciples. Listen to this statement. Discipleship doesn't begin until the gospel is within. They understood that, right? Those who are going and are willing to go, they go with the gospel in their mind because they know that the process of discipleship does not actually happen until a person has the gospel within them. A person must have repented of their sins and trusted and believed in what Jesus has done for them, accepted Him as their Lord and Savior. And when they do that, then the process of discipleship will start. So those with a me first mindset, they go with the gospel on the forefront of their mind, hoping and praying that those they encounter will love the gospel, receive the gospel, receive the story. Listen, the story, the beautiful, bloody story of the cross of Christ Jesus. They hope and pray that they'll believe in that, but they go with the gospel on their mind. They understand that they have a higher calling, and that calling is to get the gospel to the nations. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. We can't get the gospel outside the walls of this church if we don't go with the gospel. Amen? We can talk about it and have a pet rally about it every Sunday, but we've got to go with it, right? We've got to be willing to go with the gospel. I want you to listen to this statement. It's a good statement. Going is the action that gets the gospel to the right places at the right time going is the action that gets the gospel to the right places at the right time almost 25 years ago almost 25 years ago a man by the name of Tuck Roberts decided to go to Ravel Louisiana with the gospel on his mind he went to Ravel Louisiana with the gospel on his mind and on a Tuesday night he preached that gospel and for the first time, this boy, though he had heard it a thousand times, for the first time, this boy heard the gospel, and it spoke to his heart, and the Spirit of God gripped him in such a way that he couldn't stay in that pew any longer. He had to respond to the gospel of Jesus. And so he marched down that aisle, and he said, I've been living a lie all of this time. I need to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this boy got saved, and this boy is standing before you today preaching the same gospel and going to different places preaching this gospel. Why? Am I doing that because Tuck Roberts decided to go with the gospel? Going with the gospel starts a, train, a, ch a chain reaction of power that changes the landscape of humanity. So we just go with the gospel. So those who are willing to go, they go with the gospel. But here's the second thing they do. Not only do they go with the gospel, they go with mercy and grace in their hearts. They go with the gospel on their mind. But they have mercy and grace in their hearts. Listen to this. Grace and mercy are the centerpiece of being an effective witness for Jesus Christ. Without grace and mercy, we become religious. Oh, this is so good. Look at your neighbor and say, this is good right here, what he's about to say. I forgot I was going to say it. But, uh, but I, uh, when I read it, I said, oh, well, let me point that out real quick, you know. So watch this. Without grace and mercy, we become religious zealots ready to usher the sinner to the whipping post. Did you get that? Woo, son, that's, that's stout. As my friend in Crowell would say, that's stout as goat's breath. That's stout. Because without grace and mercy, what happens is 
if we don't exercise grace and mercy, we're not going to be very effective soul winners. We're not going to be very effective at discipleship because here's what's going to happen. We're just going to get ugly, right? You say, preacher, what is grace and mercy? So I know not to get ugly, right? How does that affect my life? Well, let me tell you what grace is. Grace is simply this. It is unmerited favor. It is God giving us what we don't deserve, right? That's grace. Well, what is mercy? Well, here's mercy. Mercy is having compassion towards someone. It is God not giving us what we deserve. You, you know what mercy is. I mean, many of you played that game whenever you was a kid. You could have broke somebody's fingers, but they cried mercy and you quit. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? You sizing your cousin up. You're like, I think I can get him now. I'm old enough that I can do it now, I think. So y'all lock hands. You say, all right, let's go. And then all of a sudden, your cousin's a little stronger than what you thought he was. And then all of a sudden, he doesn't. You know how you do? They turn them hands like this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Does that bring back horrible memories for people in the room? Some of y'all like, did you remember that? And then all of a sudden, he twists it up like this, and he does like it right there, and he starts, I mean, and all of a sudden, you're going, mercy, 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 mercy. He said, that's what I thought. You ain't that bad. And so mercy is, that. listen, not giving you what they could give you, right? And so when we look at the idea of grace and mercy as it pertains to God and his relationship with humanity, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy is God uh, not giving us what we do deserve. Now, you say, preacher, why are these words so important? Why is it important that we go with grace and mercy? Here's why. Because grace and mercy provide for us a lens in which we are to view the lost man. Agree? Grace and mercy provide us a lens that we ought to view the lost man. We have a tendency as believers to expect the lost man to be perfect. And when he isn't, here's what we do. We get mad about it. We get mad about it. We get judgmental about it. We get arrogant about it. And sometimes we even get loud about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody identifying with what I'm saying today? Y'all got some lost people in your life, and sometimes you just want, don't tell nobody we said this from poor people, you just want to slap them? Anybody? Now, okay, y'all raise y'all's hands. That's not right in church now. I'm just telling y'all right now. Yeah, you want to slap folks sometimes. But listen, lost men and women are not going to act like saved people. That's why it's important for us to exercise grace and mercy when we go with the gospel. We've got to know that there's something different about those who've received the gospel and those who have not received the gospel. And so the reality is this. We really need to see people through the eyes and the lens of grace and mercy. I, I believe it is possible for us to be gracious and merciful without compromising truth. See, we live in a culture today that says you can't be gracious and merciful because if you do, that means you have to compromise the truth. That's not true at all. I can tell anyone everywhere, anywhere, truth and be gracious and merciful with it. Hello, somebody. Am I the only one? Am I the only idiot in here? I mean, come on. I mean, think about this. We can be truthful and yet be gracious and merciful. Here's a statement. I want you to get this statement. Delivering truth with grace and mercy is not only possible, it's powerful. It's powerful whenever you deliver grace and truth. Uh, uh, deliver with grace and mercy truth. See, you're not going to get very far hitting people over the head with the Bible. You're just not, we, we don't live in that world anymore, people. We don't live in the 40s and 50s and things of that nature when, when revivals were the thing to do. You know what I mean? In town, you, everybody was friendly. More people seem to be more friendly to the gospel, friendly to hearing about the God. We don't live in that world anymore. So slapping people in the face with the Bible is not going to work. Now, does that mean that we don't use the Bible, preach the Bible, stand firm on the Bible? No, we, we do stand firm on the Bible. We preach the Bible. We use the Bible to win them over to Christ. But without grace and mercy, they're going to hate you. That's a good place to say amen. They're going to hate you. So you've got to use grace and mercy as you deliver truth. Now watch this. Those with a me-first mindset are willing to go with mercy and grace. And here's why they are willing to go with mercy and grace. Because they remember where they came from. They remember where they came from. Hey, I don't know if you realize this or not, but Christians weren't always Christians. L listen to this. Young people, I want you to listen to this. Because from time to time, here, here's, what we, here's what we do from time to time. You know it's good whenever you look down, you got spit on your shirt. You know what I'm saying? It's good preaching today. From time to time, we'll do what we call 
a baby dedication. Which is really more like a parent dedication, it should be. But let me tell you something about the baby dedication, because I don't want you to be deceived at all. It does absolutely nothing to save that baby. Period. All it is is a parent, supposedly, because it's become a religious exercise instead of something with meaning. It's a parent coming and saying, I believe in Christ Jesus. I believe that I'm a believer in Christ Jesus, and I'm going to live for Jesus, and I'm going to train this child to live for Jesus as well. That's what it is. But in no way, shape, or form does that baby dedication save that baby. What saves that baby is when they get old enough to understand the gospel and they respond themselves personally to the gospel. That's what saves someone. So Christians weren't always Christians. And so when we go with the gospel, we need to exercise grace and mercy because we remember where we came from. We all once were lost and in need of a Savior. You, we used to be enemies of God, is what the Bible said, and yet somebody had mercy and grace toward us, and they shared the gospel with us, and we got saved. Now, who, that's different for each person in this room. For me, it was Tuck Roberts shared the gospel with me. For you, it may have been me sharing the gospel with you. It may have been Brother Rayburn. It may have been someone else that's in your Sunday school class or another preacher, whoever it was. But they showed grace and, grace and mercy to you as they shared the gospel. They rem Listen, we remember where we came from. We weren't always saved. I used to be able to cuss folks out real good. Real good, real good. Till I got saved. I wasn't always like this. And neither were you. Number two, number two, those going who are willing to go with mercy and grace, they go because, and they exercise that grace and mercy because they know the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel applied can drag the vilest sinner from the bottomless pit of hell and transform him into marvelous masterpiece of God. Amen. And so when people go with the gospel and they go with grace and mercy, they go with grace and mercy because they know that God's gospel is powerful enough to save the most vile sinner. And so no matter who they approach, they know that the gospel will work. And so we just simply need to get the sinner in touch with the gospel. Right? So we go with the gospel, we go with the gospel uh, in our minds, and then we go with grace and mercy in our hearts. The third attribute and the final one is this, they go with the cross of Christ in their view. They go with the cross of Christ in their view. Those who are humble enough to serve and willing enough to go, they do so because they keep a picture of the bloody cross in their eyes. They understand that the cross of Christ is what drives them. Listen, it drives them to seek out the sinner because they've been to the cross. They know what the cross has done for them and they want others to experience it. So they keep their eyes on that. They know that it's the cross that motivates them to fall on their knees and pray. Hey, if you ever darken the, uh, the, 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 these aisles up here uh, to the, the altar to pray for somebody, the only reason you did that is because you've been to the cross yourself. You've got it on your mind and you want them to go there too. So you keep a picture of, your, of the cross in your mind, in your eyes, and it keeps you passionate for praying for others. It keeps you passionate enough to endure the hardships. Amen? Because it's the cross where we see the idea of forgiveness. And so you keep the cross in your view, and that just keeps you moving forward, right? It keeps you moving forward through the hardships of life. I told them over at Maru this morning, we got air conditioner trouble over there. It looks like we're going to have to replace it, uh, the whole thing. We've been patching it up for a few weeks now, and it just won't work. It's hot over there. Amen? It's hot over there, man, in the morning time sometimes. So everybody's out there, they sweating. I told them it made me feel good. I'm preaching, I'm sweating. It made me feel real good. I told them it made them feel good, too. They listening and sweating. That's pretty doggone good. So, so I, I just messed, messed around with them and said, enduring hardships. I said, but if you're here for the air conditioner, you won't be back next week. But if, you, but if you got the view of the cross in your mind, you'll be back, right? Same thing for you. <laughs> you. If you're here for anything other than the cross, you may not be back next week. But if you're here for the cross, you'll continue 
You'll keep going through the hardships, through the suffering, through all of it. Because you've got a picture of the cross in your mind. And you're going out there with the gospel. You're going to face hardships out there trying to go with the gospel of Jesus. There's some mean folks out there. There's some crazy stuff happening out there. But when you keep the cross in your view, it'll keep you moving forward. The cross of Christ must be in our view or we will only see... Oh, this is so good. The cross of Christ must be in our view or we will only see the sinner's sin and never see his soul. That's good right there, son. We've got to keep the cross in our mind and our eyes because if we don't, all we're going to see is this old sorry sinner instead of seeing the soul that Jesus could save. We've got to keep the cross in our eyes. We must keep the cross in our view because it's there that we see the love of God uh, that God had for all of humanity. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. It's there at the cross where we see the power of forgiveness. Jesus himself was dying on the cross and he looked down upon the people that were killing him, man, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If I don't keep my eyes on the cross, I'm not forgiven like that. But I keep my eyes on the cross and I know that Jesus forgave me so I can forgive others. Now, if others have done worse to you than what we did to Jesus, then you don't have to forgive them. You got my permission. But there ain't no way that anybody's done something worse to you than what we did, humanity did to Jesus. So we keep our eyes on the cross. It's where we see the power of forgiveness. It's there at the cross where we see the blood that brings new life. How many of you are thankful for new life? Because of the blood. Amen. The Bible says, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, who, who, who were, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we keep our eyes on the cross, then we will always remember that the blood will cover every man's sin, even the worst among us. Now listen to me. The blood is powerful enough to save anybody. But that anybody's got to come to him by faith. We know that from Scripture. By faith we are saved, right? By by grace we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning, here's the deal. Here's the reality. This is what's crazy about preaching. Almost everybody in this room, let's just say three-quarters of the people in this room were here last week. You heard the sermon. You heard me preach last week. And yet you came back this week. I said some of the same stuff this week I said last week. Why do you keep coming back? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. You keep him in your mind. You keep him in your eye. He'll keep you coming to be equipped so that you can do what? Go with the gospel. So that one of these days, watch this, one of these days, you're going with the gospel. You've got a friend that's got a problem at work. You're a believer. She's not. You look upon her with grace or him with grace and mercy. And just the right opportunity comes. God lays it right before you, and all of a sudden you say, can I just share something with you? Can I share with you where I used to be? And share with you what changed that. And you tell them about how you come face to face with a Savior named Jesus. Who loved you in spite of you. Died for you. Was buried and raised from the dead to give you new life. And when you chose to trust in him, you were absolutely changed. You had a new life because of his blood. And then your friend looks at you and says, what I need and you have the unique privilege to be able to say I can tell you how and you lead them to Christ whether it's at work or whether it's you brought them here and they got saved whatever the case may be and now what's happened is this you have gone you've been willing to go with the gospel with grace and mercy and all of a sudden because you've got your eyes on the cross, Jesus has saved your friend. And now your friend sits with you at church, worshiping with you, all because you were willing to go, and all because someone before you was willing to go and do the same for you. 
It's a chain reaction starting with Christ. And it just keeps going. So today the question for all of us is simply this. Two things. Number one, have you ever put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and made him Lord of your life? Because remember last week we said that Jesus said me first, but he also said when he stretched out his arms on the cross, me only. He is the only way to salvation. Have you ever put your faith and trust in Jesus? Number two, if you're already a believer in Jesus, are you living the kind of me first lifestyle that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks? If not, then today is just a great time for you to pray and ask God, help me live this me first mentality. Amen? I promise you the kingdom of God will be blessed because of your effort to do so.